Let's go back to uh, what Paul says here in verse 11. He says, the first thing that a woman should do in this situation is to relearn and to accept what is given to her, not all that malarkey that comes from the temple. I permit, this doesn't say this is God saying something or this is the rule among all churches, but he says, in this situation, I permit no woman to teach or to have, and here he uses a word that is used only once in the New Testament, a Greek word. It's authentein. It's not the regular word for uh, for authority in the New Testament, which is commonly used, and which is, uh, I'm just saying it so you hear the sound of it. The regular word is ex exousia for authority. This is a totally different word. And there is no controlled text in the New Testament to know what it means. There are a couple uses in literature outside the New Testament, but they're not conclusive. So we, nobody knows really what this is that Paul doesn't permit in relation to man, where he says, or to have whatever over man. She's to keep silent. But the prohibition to teach is very clear. And then the supposition, some, there are 12 different uh, options that scholars have for authentic. And I'm, I'm sorry, I just don't have, don't, haven't done enough work to you uh, for, for this particular word to tell you what it might mean, to tell you what I think it might mean. And even then, you know, it would be an opinion. So uh, there are some things, this is called a hapax. A hapax is something that happens only once in the Bible. A story, a line, a word that happens only once. There are some clear hapaxes where, where whoever says something which is clear, it happens only once. If there is no problem with it, it's in the Bible, it's valid. And there are some hapaxes that are unclear. What do we do with them? We leave them alone. They were clear at one point for the people who wrote it and who read it, but we've lost the meaning of them. Let me give you one, one that, that uh, troubles a lot of people. In, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, when Paul discusses the resurrection, the final resurrection, in order to catch the Corinthians in their inconsistency who said, like the materialist Greek who said, the body, dead, dead men don't rise. And he tells them, well, Jesus rose. So if he can, he can give us resurrection. Okay, in that context, he says, why do you Corinthians get baptized for the dead if there is nothing after death? He catches uh, them in their inconsistency. Now, we don't know what that baptism for the dead is. There is no, not, not, no explanation of it in the New Testament. There is no explanation of it in extra biblical literature outside of the New Testament. We can only make suppositions. But there are some people who use that hapax to establish a whole doctrine of salvation for those who are dead. Yeah, the Mormon church. Now, that, that's an abuse of the New Testament. So, so for, for anyone to say too much on this business of, on this business of uh, or to have authority over men, uh, they're not permitted to do so. They're abusing the New Testament also. I don't. I just tell you I don't know what he's after here.
and I have discussed the matter with my opponents who are against the Ministry of Women and who use this text, and some of them have been honest enough to say, yes, we don't know what that means. Okay, the other thing here is uh, verse 15. She, uh, the woman, verse 13, 14, she's been deceived, and has she's become a transgressor, she's sinned, but unwittingly, not like Adam, who was revolting against God, she was fooled, yet she will be saved through childbearing. The singular is used here. She will be saved through childbearing and all of a sudden becomes plural, provided that they, those women, they, in the plural, continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty, not like the girls at the temple. But what does it mean to be saved through childbearing? I thought that salvation was... Uh, by faith in uh, the sacrifice of Christ and through uh, faith and by God's grace without any contribution on our part except believing in it. Keseko, what's going on here? Well, this is a hapax. Is it clear? What do you mean? That women are saved by with having babies? He, it's clear for him, you know. He's talking about something, something real here, but it's not clear for us. The best supposition that there is for this is that uh, there was... Uh, at the, the cult of Artemis in the temple, that women who were uh, pregnant came to sacrifice uh, to Artemis so that their child would not die in labor, or that they wouldn't die in labor. You know, you know in those days, mortality at, at birth was very high. They didn't have the facilities and the knowledge that we have today. And some people think that that's what he's referring to. That, you know, people who are in labor uh, should not, should trust God rather than going to the temple. I don't know. There may be a shred of truth to that, but uh, uh, I don't know. So there, there is no shame in saying, I don't know. There are some things that uh, made sense when they were written, but we have become ignorant about the circumstances, the context, the historical, the social context, and we don't know what, it's, what it was. In any case, this text is used. That, that, that's the only one left, actually, by... It is used by those who are against the ministry of women to forbid women from doing ministry. Now, suppose that's what it means. Just for a moment, let's suppose. Here comes the good part. What about the man? Does he have anything to, to say about men doing ministry? Chapter 3. The next paragraph. And he's talking about the office of bishop, which, depending on churches, may have meant different things in different localities. But obviously here it's a leader. Must be above reproach, married only once. So he must be married. And, you know, his character should be in conformity with the role he's going to play. But... Something strange here, verses 4 and 5. 
there are some qualifications that we find nowhere else in the New Testament for male leadership. And those qualifications are very clear in this passage. It's a hot box, but it's a clear passage. No questions about it. You say, it, says, it says that the leader candidate must know how to manage his family so that he can manage the church. If he cannot take care of his small family, kids and wife and so on, he cannot take care of the church, which is a much bigger family. In fact, in verse 5, he says that. If someone does not know how to manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? And what does to manage his own household? He describes this in verse 4. He must manage his own household well, keeping his children submissive and respectful in every way. S keeping his children submissive and respectful in every way. Okay, now think about this. Who does this text exclude from leadership in the church? Before that, single, unmarried people, unmarried guys, they're out. Somebody mentioned Jesus, he would be out. Paul would be out. He says he's unmarried a couple of times in, in the texts. He would be out. Who else does it exclude? Married guys without children. All right? They're out. Who else? Married men with only one child. It says children, they're out. It excludes married men with more than one child. If any of them is not submissive, obedient, docile, he's out. Who else? Married men who have children who are submissive, but they're not respectful in every way. <laughs> they're out. It's black and white here. It's very explicit. So when I teach on this, I look at the congregation or the people who are in front of me. I say, okay, of, but let's be honest here. Of all you guys who are in positions of leadership in a church, how many qualified by being married, having more than one child, who are all respectful, submissive, and respectful in everything? Raise your hands. Not once yet, out of scores of opportunity, has anybody raised his hand. What I'm saying here is that, of course, Paul puts stringent limitations in Ephesus at this point of the history of the church of Ephesus on women. But he puts just about as stringent, as restrictive measures on participation by men in the ministry of the church in Ephesus. All right? How come everybody, especially male preachers and scholars, emphasize the restrictions on women in chapter 2 but not a whit about the restrictions on men in chapter 3. Uh. 
What kind of a double standard? What kind of hypocrisy is this? Once I raised the question, and uh, men promised me that they would, uh, they would consider the matter seriously because it's in the word of God. So I said, okay, let me know what happens. And they telephoned and they said, we don't, we don't find five fellows to replace the present elders, none of whom qualifies, who will uh, meet the standards here. So we don't know what to do. Well, I said, you know, what you have to do is realize that Paul was writing here to a church in a situation of crisis, that he is enforcing measures of exception that are valid for that church, or future churches today who are in the same situation where everything is messed up, when the church is a point of collapse, in that case, what you do, you, you start again. You know, however you want, you, you, may, you can. But they said, well, the Bible tells us that uh, we should find the men who qualify on the basis of their family status, okay? I, what I think is that what is enforceable here is the principle. The principle is when uh, in a situation of crisis, you're very careful to find the best qualified people to resolve the crisis, the best management people. In this case, the test was the family. To date, maybe some other test. The, the point is, you, you get rid of the, uh, of the people who fail, you pray, p p replace them with people who are qualified. Well, and, and they did. They did for two, three months. I said, well, the next best thing then is to say that uh, to allow the women to be part of leadership. Perhaps you find women who are qualified. Okay? Because he's talking to men here in chapter 3. He's not saying anything to, to women uh, uh, in terms of their family life being a test of their uh, uh, ability to lead. And they said, no, we take chapter 2 very seriously. We don't want our women to teach or to have authority over men. Then I say, if you don't find men who qualify just as stringently to uh, candidate for leadership, then you close up the church. And you know what? They, that's what they did. They closed up the church. They said, we want to be faithful to the scriptures. So they closed up the church. And the people went to other congregations in the neighborhood. I think, I think they're honest, you know. On their premises, they're honest. I think the premises are stupid, but I think, I think they were stupidly honest. Because what, what is very clear here is that the church was, he, he never has those rules. We saw it yesterday, didn't we? We went through every epistle and we saw that ministry was for all, that there were no exceptions. No excuses and no exceptions, remember? Nobody excludes oneself, nobody excludes someone else. We saw that in Romans and Corinthians and Ephesians. All the way through, that is the pattern. Everybody who is gifted and everybody is gifted in some way participates in the ministry of the church without any discrimination. That is the rule. This is the exception. Okay? We don't establish policy for the church today on the basis of the exception. We go by the rule that prevailed for all churches. So what I'm calling for is consistency. If we're going to enforce this exception for all churches uh, in chapter 2, let us be consistent and do, it, do the same thing for the men in chapter 3. And then let's see what happens.
it would be such a disaster that they would come back and rethink the thing and perhaps change our minds on the validity of female ministries in the church. That may happen yet in two, three generations. It won't happen in my generation. I'll long be gone before it happens. You remember uh, the, the chart I gave you yesterday? for new plant churches, this being the institution. This being community. This being desirable. This being desirable also, but in diminishing quantity the less there is institution, the more there is community. What Paul is doing here, he's saying you failed at community. We start all over again. The church is sick. It's like planting a new church. So this is for new churches here, or sick churches, where there is a need for very strong leadership, low community because there is no community yet or else it has fallen apart. But the purpose is not to stay static like this here because you're stuck and nothing will happen. The church will not grow but to move on by the leaders allowing more and more community, developing more and more community, the first becoming last, the way we showed the other day, remember that? Developing leaders, ministers, prophets, whatever you want to call them, the, the, the titles don't matter. In fact, the less titles, the better for the community. And, uh, and then to, to, to come to the point where community works well. There is always need for, for uh, leadership as a safety net. You know, in case of crisis, in case of disciplinary measures, there is a need for some people, always plural. Huh? Leadership in the New Testament is always collegial, a group of people. There is no model in the New Testament for the one-person church. The only one there is in this sick church of uh, Ephesus when Timothy took over. And even then, he had a team around him. We know that from the, from the epistles himself. But, uh, but always plural and... Uh, invisible and conspicuous as possible or else identified so closely with the congregation that nobody really stands out as uh, the dominant force within a congregation. It's not good for the congregation. It's not good for the person. I'm so glad here that you have ministers all over the place. You know, you have pastors who share the pulpit and much of the decision making process with people. You have a council that, that, that meets well, how many? 10, 12 people to, for decision making. So a representative body. That's the way it should be. Okay, that's the church that functions well. But uh, every church after a crisis should start here in order to resolve the crisis but move toward here. And really, when you look at it, all churches are somewhere along this line. For instance, International Gospel Center. I'm sure it's way up here. Willow Creek has come up here, perhaps, and goes back and forth. So...
what does the epistle say? The epistle to the Ephesians says, you know, uh, what is important is to form the community of oneness, but, uh, but there are dangers on the way, and be careful not to get trapped. And if you get trapped, if there are troubles, try to save the church by all means, and use your best people to do so under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. There's one more reference to, uh, to the church of Ephesus. Guess where it is? You're right. Revelation chapter 3. No, actually, it's, uh, it's the first letter to the churches, so it's chapter 2. It's the risen Christ here who is uh, walking among the lampstands, among the symbols of the churches. And he says to the, the angel of the church in Ephesus, to the representative of the symbolic representative of the church in Ephesus, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance. This is written at the end of the century, like like uh, 40 years after Timothy, 45 years, almost half a century after first Timothy, huh? I know what's going on, he says. I know how hard you worked and you tried and you endured. And uh, I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles or not and have found them to be idle, to be false. Okay, so uh, did, did the measures that Paul used to combat the evildoers in Ephesus work or not? Of course it worked. Because he is writing a letter of commendation telling them you did right. You did what Paul told you to do. But I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Okay, it's been tough. And you know, some been, something's been lost. Um, in the wranglings, in the chaos, something been, been lost that was, that, that was so basic to the making of community because that's what it's all about, it's what holds the oneness of community together, both in heaven and on earth. It's love. And that's a fall. It's a downfall that requires repentance. Verse 5, remember from where you have fallen. If you can remember those days when there was love, there was thriving community, caring, and so on, and do the works you did at first go back and function the way you did. If not, you're useless. You don't have love. You may, you may have fought the uh, false doctrines and the representatives of the temple up there on the hill, but if not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Start all over again. This is another start that he's advising. Not an organizational start, but a, a start of a change of heart. You know what's behind this? Remove your, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place. Why so? There is a saying in my country that goes like this. Better. Better, no lighthouse at all than a lighthouse without a light. Can picture in your mind why, huh? That's what he's saying here. I will remove it from, you, from its place. Yet this is, this 
is to your credit, you hate the works of the heretics, which I also hate. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit says, to everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. Do you remember there were two trees that were designated in the garden at the beginning? One was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the other one was the tree of life. And they were prevented from going to the tree of life because salvation is not automatic. See? It takes a sacrifice. But now that the end is near, you'll have the tree of life always around you. Because that's eternal life that you're going to. In this context, since we're in the book of Revelation, I'd like to go back to something that we glossed over on the first session that we had on Wednesday, which is pertinent to what we're doing here because it's, the, it's about the destiny, eternal destiny of the community. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 17. You remember now? This is when Abram meets God again for a confirmation covenant that has been made with him and God to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. So Abram again falls on his face. That happened in chapter 12 again. He worships God. And God says to him, this is my covenant with you. A covenant is a deal, an agreement, like a contract signed by both. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. Okay, so uh, his ancestry is not one nation, but his real ancestry is a multitude of nations. And this is by faith. He's going to have one nation by race, but the nation by race is uh, is there to fulfill a mission and when they fulfill their mission they have fulfilled their mission they become one among all the multitude of nations you shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations and as a proof your name is changed for Abraham which means father of a family to Abraham which means uh, the ancestor, father of a multitude of nations. What we didn't point out is the promise that accompanies this change of name and of mission. I will make you extremely fruitful. Nations will come out of you, and among them kings. I will establish my, my covenant between me and you and your offspring, the multitude of nations forever. And I will to, to give to you and to your offspring. Who is the offspring? Who, 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 who is the progeny, the, the offspring, of, uh, according to this text? According to this text, is what? A multitude of nations. Okay. I will give to your offspring the land where you now live as an alien, the land of Canaan, for a perpetual holding. What is he saying here? He's saying, for eternity, the land belongs to the multitude of nations. What in the world does that mean? You see, it's baffling, isn't it? 
You know, every time I go to what is called the Holy Land, there's nothing holy about it, uh, I see the evidences of those people fighting over the land over there. And I say, you clowns, you're fighting over something that belongs to me as a representative of the multitude of nations, of the community of eternity, of the church. That ain't your land, it's my land. Well, how can you say that? It's confirmed in the New Testament, amazingly. You wouldn't know it today because of the political tenor of the times, considering what, is, what they think about the, the land and how it, they treat it. But in Hebrews chapter 1, the great chapter on the heroes of faith, there is an explanation. Verse 8, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he set out not knowing where he was going. By faith he stayed in the land that he had been promised as in a foreign land. You know, he is an immigrant through the land, living in tents, never laid a stone on top of one another for building a permanent residency, never putting a stake in the land. And Isaac and Jacob did like him. Why? Because they were heirs with the promise that Abraham had received. And because he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect is God. It means here that the land was a symbol of a real city that has foundations, not tents, not a place for aliens and sojourners. Verse 13, all these, Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, so those people, they died in faith without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted way far on the horizon. They said hello to the promises. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth. They didn't have a place. For people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. Now, if they had been thinking of land, of real estate, they could have gone where they had come from. There was plenty of land there. Verse 16, but as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. What he's saying is that the, the land, the real estate that God had promised to them was a symbol of an eternal reality. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city again for them. What is that city? Chapter 12. That beautiful passage that pastor read to us on Wednesday. You remember? With such passion, I saw it come, come alive. But you, Christians, have come to Mount Zion. Mount Zion is where Jerusalem is. To the city of the living God. To the heavenly Jerusalem. Not that stinking place where there is murder, injustice, and violence all the time. But to the heavenly Jerusalem to innumerable angels gathered together and to the assembly of the firstborns who are enrolled in heaven, that's us, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to us again, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, everybody's there, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks to us. Okay, so what he's saying here is that the city 
is uh, a an illustration of the community in heaven. The city is where people are gathered together in great number, living at close quarters. Well, that's what it's going to be. It's the community of heaven. And then finally, we go to Revelation. The last word in the in the Bible on this matter is in verse tw- chapter twenty-one. Then, I'm sorry, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven, the first earth has passed away. And even the sea was no more. There's nothing left of our, of our universe. It's all disappeared. It's fallen into a giant black hole and it's gone into nothingness. What had been... polluted by sin and death is purged away. What remains? And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem. The holy city. Notice that, huh? Coming down out of heaven from God. It is the work of God. It is the work of God. Through the century, it is the work of God putting together that community of eternity of the redeemed. The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Is that a hint or not as to the identity of the city, the bride, the bride, beautiful bride of chapter 5 of Ephesians that we were talking about a moment ago? That he loves so much. Verse 9. Then the angel comes to me and he says, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away to a high mountain and showed me what? The holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. It had the glory of God. Of all the things that exist, when history transitions into eternity, everything disappears. Except for the community of oneness, made of multitude of nations, who will be united with the Creator for eternity. That, my friends, is your destiny. Thank God.